issues. But before we can get into talking about some of these topics, we need to define some important terms so we're all on the same page about how we use language, and we need to understand some very basic principles about how the brain is organized. So the next few lectures are going to provide that foundation material on which the rest of the course is going to be based. The terms, definitions, and other things we'll talk about and learn in this first part of the course are going to be important for understanding all of the other lectures. In this specific lecture, what we want to do is talk about the gross organization of the brain. And that term in neuroscience is used to mean the external features of the brain, what can be seen without the aid of a microscope. So when we talk about the gross organization of the brain, it's the overall big, large organization of the brain. We're going to return to a discussion of function of individual areas at a later time, but here we're going to learn some definitions and terms so that we all know where we're at when we talk about the brain. So let's start with some of those basic definitions. The term central nervous system refers to the brain and the spinal cord. The brain is continuous with the spinal cord through a hole in the skull, which is called the foramen magnum. So you all know that your spinal cord is in fact protected by bony vertebrae, and then your brain is in this compartment here. And the brain and spinal cord have to be continuous so there's a hole in the bottom of the skull. And this is where the brain and the spinal cord are continuous. This course is going to focus primarily on the brain, so that part of the central nervous system. But there is another part to the nervous system that we aren't going to cover in this course, and that's called the peripheral nervous system. So the peripheral nervous system is actually than any neural element that lies outside of the brain and spinal cord. So the peripheral nervous system would be, for example, you have a long nerve called the sciatic nerve that runs down the back of the leg. This is part of the peripheral nervous system. Any part of a nervous structure, whether it's a nerve cell or a process of a nerve cell that lies outside of the brain and spinal cord would be part of the peripheral nervous system. Now, throughout this course, we're going to be using what I call the handy-dandy brain model. And this beautiful model, you turn it like this, you can see it from different sides. Um, the one in your head is actually much more beautiful than this. We're going to be using this when we point out different areas of the brain, so it's important that you be able to immediately orient to this model. Now, just like we have two sides to the body, we have a right and left side to our body, we have two hemispheres in our brain. This model is only one hemisphere, so it's used for teaching purposes, so the other hemisphere, which would be located here, is not shown. So what we want to know is where the front and the back of the brain are at. So whenever I talk about something and refer to this model, then you can look at it and you'll know where we are. This is the front of the brain and this is the back of the brain. And one of the ways you can always know that this is the back of the brain is to orient to this little structure right here. This little fist-shaped structure is called the cerebellum and it's going to be a topic of one of the lectures later on. But the cerebellum is here at the base of the skull, and so you can always tell where the back of the brain is. The other thing I want you to notice with this model is that this is a right hemisphere. So this is the front, this is the back, and that would make this a right hemisphere of the brain. So when we talk about these different structures, and I point things out in this model, then you'll know um, basically where you're at. Now, if we looked at the central nervous system from the outside, so we imagine that this was our brain, and we're going to look at it from the outside. If we look down here, we would see the spinal cord. So again, the spinal cord is part of the central nervous system, and it is... Um, part of the central nervous system and protected by that bony vertebrae. It's connected to the brain via that hole in the skull, the foramen magnum. Now what you can see from this external feature here, if we turn the brain model like this and look, is you see this part up here that is attached to the spinal cord is called the brain stem. And the brain stem is um, 
an older area of the brain, and it got its name from the fact that if I take this other half, now this would be for the other hemisphere, the left hemisphere, that is not on this model. But if you took this and you looked at just this part here, and then you thought of this and all of this hemisphere is sitting on top of it, it would look like this was a stem. And that's exactly where the name comes from. So the big hemispheres and the parts of the brain here that are very highly evolved and, and, and part of that characterizes the human brain sit upon this brain stem, and that's where it got its name. So that's a very old area of the brain. Let's turn this over this way since we're looking from the external features here. So you see your spinal cord. You only see part of the brain stem. And the reason for that is because these huge hemispheres in the human being cover over the rest of it. So if we looked grossly and looked from the outside, we could only see the spinal cord, a part of the brain stem, and then we would see the huge hemisphere surrounding it. Now, in order to um, basically refer to different structures in the brain, we have to learn a number of different reference terms. And these have, uh, you know, are given by names that may not be familiar to you. So, for example, the terms rostral caudal. The terms rostral caudal, rostral means anterior, superior, or towards the face. And so it would be towards the face end of the individual. This would be rostral. So this would be rostral in the brain. The term caudal means towards the tail end or the back or posterior. And so that would be the back of the brain. The cerebellum would be a caudally located structure. Now, there are two other terms. One is called dorsal and one is ventral. And dorsal and ventral refer to a, a surface, the upper surface of the brain, or reference. And uh, ventral refers to the under surface. So this would be dorsal in the hemisphere. This is ventral under here. For the spinal cord, this is dorsal and this is ventral. And if that's confusing to you, don't let it be confusing. I always try to uh, explain this to my students by saying, imagine one of my dachshunds. So here's a long sausage-shaped dog, and imagine it with its little head slightly down. Well, all of this would be dorsal, and everything on the underside would be ventral. So human beings, we have this huge, we stand upright, we have this huge hemisphere, and we have a bend in our neck. If I turn my head like this and remove the bend in my neck, you see that this is dorsal, this is ventral. And so what we have when we return the bend to the neck, this is dorsal, this is ventral, this is dorsal, this is ventral. So when we refer to different parts of the brain, we will often make, use these kinds of this language or terminology. And to just make sure that this is very clear, let's look at a drawing of the brain and here again, here's an eyeball drawn in, and that eyeball shows you this is where the face would be. So this is rostral, this is towards the head end, or anterior, and this is caudal, or towards the tail end, or posterior, and this would be the dorsal surface of the brain, and this would be the ventral surface of the brain, or the undersurface. And you're looking through the hemisphere, and here's your brain stem down here, and your spinal cord, and the foramen magnum is right here, or the hole in the skull, where the brain and the spinal cord are connected. Now, there are two other terms that are commonly used, but these are terms that are more often used in the general vernacular, and these are medial and lateral. So medial and lateral refer to towards the midline or away from the midline. So as I turn this model and you look at this surface of this model, this is the medial surface of the right hemisphere because it's right where the midline would be. Remember, there are two hemispheres in the brain, so this would be where the midline is at. So this would be the medial surface. This, on the other hand, would be the lateral surface of the right hemisphere. Now, you're already 
uh, recognizing, I'm sure, that the terms rostral, caudal, dorsal, ventral, and medial and lateral aren't used just to refer to absolute places, but they're used to refer to uh, different structures in relative terms. So let me give an example of that. If I place my finger right here on this area of the brain, this is rostral to any area back here, but caudal to this area of the brain. So it's also used as a relative term. So if I want to talk about a structure within the brain, I may, might say that it is lateral to X, but that same structure could be medial to another structure. So as we use these terms throughout the course, I will try to be very specific about my use of language, but just remember that these are just basic terms that allow us to front and back upper surface, under surface, and lateral to medial. And this is how neuroscientists talk to each other. Now, we can grossly divide the brain into five subdivisions. And here specifically, we're dealing with the adult brain. We're going to talk later about how these different subdivisions of the brain actually arise in development. And that is a fascinating subject in itself. But there are five subdivisions to the adult human brain. So if we start from rostral to caudal, and remember the brain is one part of the central nervous system. If we start rostral to caudal, the five subdivisions of the brain are the telencephalon, the diencephalon, the mesencephalon, the metencephalon, and the myelencephalon. So these are terms you may have heard, or maybe one or more of these terms you may have um, heard before. And what we will want to do when we talk about various structures of the brain, we'll always say that this structure lies in the diencephalon or this structure lies in the telencephalon. So it's important to know what these refer to. So let's look back at our drawing now. And now we have shown on here, our, our drawing, here's the front of the brain. Here's where our eye is at. So this is taken in this plane. So you can see the front of the brain and the back of the brain. And let's look at these subdivisions again. Here's our telencephalon. Our telencephalon is basically this huge hemisphere that we can see from the external side out here, this huge thing that we think is characteristic of the human brain. If we could look through this hemisphere then, we could see the next subdivision of the brain, which is the diencephalon. And the diencephalon is composed of two subunits, the thalamus and the hypothalamus. The next division of the brain we come to is the mesencephalon. And the mesencephalon, it means midbrain, and it's approximately in the middle of the brain and lies right here. And the next subdivision of the brain is the metencephalon, and the metencephalon consists of two structures, the cerebellum and a structure called the pons, which we're going to talk about in a minute. And then the last subdivision here of the brain is going to be the myelencephalon. And it's the myelencephalon that's connected to the spinal cord. So I wanted to have you look at this on the drawing. This drawing is also in the booklet that accompanies your course. So as we talk about these different areas of the brain, if you would like to follow along in that booklet, you can, or you can just follow along as I point to the brain model and what is on the brain model. So let's begin again with the telencephalon. The telencephalon would be the rostral most subdivision of the adult human brain. So the telencephalon is all of this you see on the lateral surface, and it's also all of this you see on the medial surface. And the telencephalon is the most recently evolved area of the brain, and its function is going to be the focus of many of the lectures of this course because it is the outer surface of this telencephalon, just the outer rim of it,
which we know is called the cortex, which is believed to be the seat of the mind. So it is the outer part of the telencephalon, which will be the focus of many of, of our lectures. This enormous elaboration of this outer part of the telencephalon, the cortex, is in fact um, what is associated with um, the human brain. And so we see that the cortex is very enlarged. If we look at the brains of other animals, their cortex uh, is much smaller. And we'll talk a little bit about how our brain differs uh, from that of animals in some of the other lectures. The next area, if you remember, as we go rostral to caudal, is going to be the diencephalon. So the diencephalon, so if I take my little part of my brain model here, here's my brain stem down that I'm holding, and then on top of that, so I want you to imagine, this is for the other hemisphere, so the other hemisphere would be over this. So if I take this off like this, this would be your diencephalon. So your diencephalon is also part of what is sitting on the brain stem. So the diencephalon is the next subdivision of the brain we come to, and it is subdivided into two different areas. A dorsal division, which means up, a dorsal division called the thalamus, and a ventral subdivision right down here, which is called the hypothalamus. So, what is the thalamus? What does that word mean? The word thalamus means anteroom. It means the room before something. And this is very interesting because that's exactly what the thalamus is. The thalamus is a structure, and here it is located here. And if I turn this, you can see that it's made up of a number of individual structures. That's what all those different colors refer to, made up of a number of different structures. Most of the, the areas that are found in the thalamus are going to communicate with the cortex. And it turns out that almost all of the information that wants to go to the cortex, with the rarest exception, almost all information that wants to get to the cortex has to go through the thalamus first. So the term anteroom is very appropriate. It's the room before the main room. And the cortex, being the seat of the mind, is, of course, the main room. Now, the term hypothalamus, also part of the diencephalon, hypothalamus being located below the thalamus. The hypothalamus is also made up of a number of individual areas. So there are many different areas in this collective term called the hypothalamus. Now, if we wanted to stand back and look at what the overall function of the hypothalamus was, it would be to maintain homeostasis in the body. So I think the best example of that is um, temperature control. Our temperature is regulated around a normal level. And if it goes up, the hypothalamus is going to try to bring it down. And if it falls, the hypothalamus will try to bring it up. So we have these homeostatic mechanisms that maintain homeostasis in the body. And the thalamus, the hypothalamus, is one of the main areas that does that. The next subdivision of the brain that we come to is the mesencephalon or the midbrain. And this is the area which is about in the center of the, or the middle part of the brain. It's located right here where my finger is at. And that is where the midbrain is localized. Now, the midbrain has a lot of functions. But if we had to choose one thing and say that a lot of this was covered by the midbrain, it would be reflexes. So to just give you an idea, in this structure here, and I'm going to put my just the end of my finger on this structure. They're very small, so it makes it very difficult to see. But I'm going to put my finger right here. It's a little blue area right here on this brain. This structure is called the superior colliculus, and it is located in the midbrain. It is one area in the midbrain. The superior colliculus, 
or it's also called the rostral colliculus because it's rostrally located structure. Colliculus means little hill. So it's the rostrally located little hill is involved in visual reflexes. So for example, if there was suddenly a bright light over here, I might turn my head, close my eyes and lift my arm like this. That reflex is governed by the superior colliculus through its connections to other areas of the brain that are control the movement of my hands, the closing of my eyes, and the protection of my face. And so this is a reflex. You don't say, oh, look, there's something bright over there. It could be potentially damaging to me. I wonder what I ought to do. You don't do that. You have reflexes that kick in, and this is where visual reflexes are controlled. We'll learn that in other animals who don't have any need for doing that. Let's imagine one. Let's think about this. In the lowly toad, which was one of my favorite research subjects when I ran a research lab, in the lowly toad, what he wants to use his superior colliculus for is to localize prey in space. So, for example, what he wants to do is when something small and dark and jerky comes into his field of view, he wants to turn towards it and stick out his tongue and get it. That's a reflex, and it's controlled by the very same structure in his brain. Fortunately, we don't do that, or not many of us stick out our tongue to catch prey in space. Anyway, most of us don't. So these uh, reflex functions are different depending on the niche of the animal, and that should also make sense. We have the same structures in our brain that other animals have for these types of functions, but they've been modified because our niche is different, and so the connections of these structures have been modified. Now, we have other kinds of reflexes that are also controlled by this midbrain. The next area of the brain, and again going rostral to caudal, so we've already covered the midbrain, the next area of the brain we come to is called the metencephalon. And the metencephalon consists of two separate structures. One is the cerebellum, which is this fist-shaped structure here at the base of the brain. And we're going to be talking about this incredible structure. It is actually responsible for the coordination of learned, skilled motor movement. And so it's extremely important in human beings. The other part of the metencephalon is the pons. And the pons is this sort of little bump right here. Now, to help you remember these terms, because these probably, some of them at least, aren't terms that you've heard before. The term pons means bridge. And so you can remember a major function of this area of the brain, because what the pons does is connect the cerebellum to the rest of the brain. So it acts as a bridge between the cerebellum and the brain. And so it's named again perfectly for what it does. Now, we know that many of these areas of the brain do many more things, but the early neuroanatomists gave them the most obvious name, and so PONS fits very, very well. Now, let me give you an example of that. Let's imagine that I want to reach over and I want to touch this brain model. As I reach out, I have a gross movement towards the brain model, but as I get closer and closer, and if I want to touch just the top of it, my movement becomes very, very precise. In order to make that movement, two things have to happen. One, I have to initiate the motor movement, and that is actually done by a structure that's located here in the telencephalon. So there's an area of the telencephalon that will initiate the motor movement. Now, once the movement's initiated, however, the cerebellum has to know what movement's going to be initiated, otherwise it can't coordinate it. So in the pons, there are going to be processes from this area that initiates the movement that will connect to the pons. And the pons will send the information to the cerebellum telling the cerebellum what movement the cortex has just initiated. And that allows my cerebellum then to coordinate that movement and allow me to make this very precise, controlled, skilled motor movement.
And again, we will have whole lecture on this structure, which is just fascinating. It's, it's a structure that is very, very well understood in neuroscience and a fascinating structure in its own right. The myelencephalon is the last subdivision of the brain, and the myelencephalon is going to be the area which is continuous with the spinal cord to that hole in the skull, the foramen magnum. So the myelencephalon also goes by the name medulla or medulla oblongata, and the myelencephalon or medulla is a very old area of the brain, and the term actually means long white marrow structure. Now that doesn't necessarily have any inherent good meaning for you, but it will make sense when I tell you one thing. Basically, you do all your thinking, planning, perceiving, and everything up here. But in order to make a motor movement, for example, you have to get the information down to your spinal cord because it's your spinal cord that's going to have the neurons or nerve cells that go out to the muscle and cause contraction. So all of the information to make that happen has to travel through that area of the brain. Now let's think of something else. Imagine you're touched on your leg or you have a sensation in your leg or you move your joint. You know where your leg is at. In order for you to have a conscious perception of that, that information has to get up to the brain in order for you to have a conscious perception. And that means all of those pathways that are going to carry that information also have to go through the myelencephalon. So everything that wants to communicate down has to go through there. And everything down that wants to communicate up has to go there too. And that's why the early neuroanatomists, they opened it up, they looked, and they saw that it had, we'll talk about what, what it means to say it was full of white matter, but it's basically full of the processes of neurons that communicate back and forth between the brain and the spinal cord. And that's why they gave it the name, the long white marrow structure. And so these old names that are from long, long, long ago, actually are very, very good at describing uh, what the structures are about. Now, one more time. There are five subdivisions to the adult human brain. From rostral to caudal, these would be telencephalon, which is what we characterize our human brain, diencephalon, mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon, and then continuous with the spinal cord. And all of this together constitutes our central nervous system. There are a few other terms that are used. Um, they've actually undergone some change in how they've been defined over the years, but I will use what we now currently, uh, the definitions we currently use. Uh, one of these terms is forebrain. So we talk about four brain structures. Whenever you hear that term or you read that in a book, four brain refers to the telencephalon and the diencephalon. So the four brain are going to represent the most recently evolved and most highly developed areas of the human brain. So this is what's meant by the four brain. When we talk about the hind brain, on the other hand, we talk about the hind brain, we're talking about these caudal structures. So, for example, the medulla would be part of the hind brain. And the brain stem in these uh, hind brain regions, like the medulla, would be found in any animal that has a brain. And they control a lot of the vital but largely unconscious processes of the brain, like breathing, heart rate, very fundamental things like that. They're not involved in reasoning and thinking. That's telencephalic, okay? And the diencephalon, mostly the thalamus, sending information up to the telencephalon. And the last term that we need to define is brain stem. And again, this is just what I'm holding in my hand, where my hand is at, is the stem upon which the diencephalon and the telencephalon rest. So the brain stem is the mesencephalon, metencephalon, and myelencephalon upon which the forebrain sits.
So that's where it gets its name, brainstem. Okay. And to summarize what we've covered in this lecture, want to go to an MRI. This is actually one of my MRIs, so that's my brain. Um, this is the front of my face. You can see all this fatty tissue here that's around my eyeball. This is an air sinus. And with this method, which is just an imaging method, how we look at the brain, see the scalp out here, then the bone is dark, and then here's my brain itself. And lo and behold, here's my teal encephalon right here. We're looking sort of at a medial section. Here's my diencephalon right here. Dorsal would be the thalamus, ventral the hypothalamus. This is where my midbrain is located here. The superior colliculus and inferior colliculus would be located right here. Down here we have the metencephalon, which is the cerebellum. And here's my pons, pons being the bridge that bridges the cerebellum with the rest of the brain. And down here, the myelencephalon and my spinal cord protected by the bony vertebrae. Thank you.